I'd never seen her like that. It was hard. It's very hard to talk about. <laughs> um, I was really scared. I was like, all of this will stop if I'm not here. And that was the scariest thing about it, is it was such clear thinking. I remember her telling me that, that she had wanted to take her own life. And, um, and that really broke my heart because I knew that she would actually think of not wanting to be here. That, uh, it's, that's not an easy one for a mom to hear, you know? Uh, and I can't protect her. H can't protect her. I was devastated. I, I knew that she was struggling, but I never thought that it would get to that stage. They knew how bad it was. They thought, why couldn't she just deal with it? Well, let's say hello to Fuminish. They want to hear from you. Oh. Yes, they? they're here. Hi. Hi. Say hi, Fumination. I love you. Hi, Fumination. I love you. My sisters. My sisters. My daughters. And my daughters. And my aunties. And all my aunties. <laughs> <laughs> we work from home. So that is Ula's office and this is mine. And as you very well know, he helps me behind the scenes. And one of you had said, oh, Fumi, when he walks by, tell him to say hello. And I said, you are absolutely right. It's good manners. Hello, my darling Fumi Nation. How are you? How are we? My name is Fumi De Salovold. For those of you that are stopping by for the very first time, you are so very welcome indeed. Last week, I did an episode about Harry and um, for those of you that were asking because you said wow for me did you get to read the book I did the episode a few hours before he went on air to talk about his book Spare and a lot of you said for me please 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 you haven't talked about their netflix docuseries that they had last year i would have done it at the time but i was sick my nanny was sick and so it has to be pushed up until today a lot of you from harry's review that i did asked me to do a review on the netflix and so i am here it is my channel but it is absolutely your show. So here we are. The first time I ever saw Megan was a beauty campaign that she did with Bobby Brown. And I thought to myself, what a beautiful girl. I never watched Suits, so I didn't know she was on the show. I saw her from there. And then I was doing um, a winter collection of white sweater, white coat, white trousers. You guys already know I love that monochrome look. And so I was looking through for inspiration and I saw her again. And I thought, what a pretty girl. I didn't think anything of it. That was that. Up until the Invictus Games, when Harry walked out with her. And I said, is that not the same girl that I saw? Because when you start to see somebody repeatedly, you go back just to double check is she the same one? And I was so happy for a number of reasons. The first one being, Harry looked amazingly happy. So, so, so happy. And instantly I said, I think he's going to marry this girl. Instantly I said that. We come to find out that she was in her late 30s, she's an actress, she's mixed race, she was formerly divorced, she lived in Canada, and she just oozed this confidence. I liked her. I liked the fact that she did philanthropy. I liked the fact that she spoke up for herself. I liked the fact that she was confident. I liked the fact that she had had her own life. And she was very different from Kate, who I also like and love. And Kate had had a 10-year relationship with William. They went to school together before she married William. 
and have three beautiful children. And it was nice to see Harry with his own happiness. Up until that point, he was the third wheel with William and Kate in a good way. But I understand what that is because I was the last to get married in my family. Ula was the last to get married in his family. I will never ever forget the winter, January of 2009. My brother had just had his second daughter and Ronke was pregnant with, with Quincy. And I remember sitting there happy for them, but saying to myself, Fumi, you need to catch up though. You need to get yours going. And I remember when I met Ula, we talked and we bonded. It was obvious that I'm black and he's white, but we bonded over that, that we were the last to get married, that I was in my late, late thirties and he was 45. And that bonded us. I bring that up because it was obvious that Megan is biracial. But I think what bonded them was the broken families that they had come from. I think when I watched the docu-series, there was a part where Megan said, I had two homes. I wish that there were two of me. Because when they were introducing Megan, they kept on saying that she's black, she's a divorcee, she's an actress, and she's from a broken home. And I said, and so is Harry. And it did not mean anything to Harry, most especially because Harry had been doing a lot of philanthropy work in Africa. So I see how his attitude to a lot of things had changed. I also knew that the press were going to dig for anything that Megan had done in the past. I knew. The wedding was beautiful. She looked absolutely gorgeous with little freckles on her face. And leading up to the wedding and on the day of the wedding, I truly believed her father would show up and walk her down the aisle because you've left your home. She had left her career. She had left everything to come and marry Harry and adopt Harry's world as hers. Is it wonderful to marry up? Yes, and I don't see the sin in that because I heard, oh, you know, it was Prince William, so of course she would have said yes. Wouldn't have you? Let's be honest. Wouldn't have you? Considering that we had not known anything prior to that. Wouldn't have you been charmed and said, a prince wants to date me? A prince wants to marry me? Yes. I will stand first in line. And I will say, yes, I would have. How much homework should she have done to know what it was to be a royal? I will say this, it could never have prepared her for what she walked into. Megan was in her 30s, 36, 37, I don't remember exactly. But someone who has gone through a fertility journey she did not have the advantage that Kate had. There were so many rumors. You don't know her well enough. It's all too soon. It's all too rushed. Your fertility eggs don't care. They will continue to diminish. The same thing with myself and Ula. I was 39 and he was 44. We got married the same year because we got work to do because I can't wait around because I have to have children. And as you very well know, it took us 10 years before Adrian came around and nine rounds of IVF. And so when I saw that Megan and Harry had decided to get married, I prayed so hard. I said, go ahead and have your babies real quick. I'm going to jump around with the docu-series because there were so many things that, you know, unraveled. And um, I remember when they left, 
And I said, Megan, you have to be calm because you can easily miscarry. And she did. I'm so happy that Lilibet, her rainbow baby, came around. While Megan was here, the press were merciless. If she held her tummy this way, she was holding her tummy too much. But Kate did the same thing. And there was nothing wrong with that. If she said she ate avocados, it was horrible. But yet, Kate did. And there was a comparison board, which was very obvious while Megan was here, that she would never ever be given a break. And yet, Kate was embraced for the very same things that Megan was doing. It's unfortunate, and I think it's why I identify with Megan's journey so much. Because I'm black, I'm an American, I came from California, and I left everything, and I relocated to Norway, where I didn't have any family that lived there with me. The flip side was that I had a fantastic father-in-law. Fantastic, amazing and the country is amazing, and I am not a celebrity. And I had my family army that showed up and showed out. And I will forever be grateful to them for that. I can never repeat my wedding, my traditional wedding, he's here on my channel. And I remember I wept when my father was walking me down the aisle in Norway, because you have your people so that anything you do to Fumi, you do to us. We here. And I tell you this, it was part of why we had three weddings. Because each camp wanted to show out. They were so happy for us. You had found your significant other at last. And that was what I felt for Harry. That he had found his significant other after losing his mother, never getting over it, he was happy at last. Morning of the 19th of May will start off unconventionally because it will be her mother who will be in the car with her as she drives here along the long walk up to the castle. Megan will meet her father, Thomas Markle, at the West Steps to St George's Chapel before he walks her down the aisle. But when Megan's father flies in on the week before the wedding, he will be meeting his daughter's soon-to-be husband for the very first time. It's amazing what people will do when offered a huge amount of money. 50,000, 100,000 to hand over photographs, to create a story. The week before our wedding, when we get a call from our joint communications secretary, it said this story is going to come out tomorrow, saying that your father has been staging pictures and taking money from the press. And I was like, what kind of pictures? They were relatively innocuous enough. You know, there was one of him looking at a book of the UK. I remember I naively went into the office and I said, isn't that sweet? Because I genuinely was in this sort of matrimony love fest bubble and a colleague um, sort of brought me down to earth fairly quickly and said, that's a setup." That was the first I was hearing of it. And I remember Jason said, you just need to call him and find out if this is true or not, because it could be really damaging. H and I called my dad. I said, look, they're saying you're taking money from the tabloids to stage photos. Is this true? Because no. And we, on that call, I'd said to him, look, if this story, if they can't stop it, then it's gonna come out tomorrow, so why don't we send someone right now to your house to get you out of there now? Because if that's the case, your house will be stormed by media. We'll get you out of there now. It's like, we'll just come and get you a day early. Let's get you out of Mexico. 
And he said, no, no, I have things I need to do. And it felt really cagey. I was like, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. And when we hung up, I looked at age. I was like, I don't know why, but I don't believe him. You were in charge of royal protection. Um, how would you characterize the threats that Meghan and Harry received? Well, disgusting and very real. I've talked publicly for many years about the threat of extreme right-wing terrorism in this country. I've often been misquoted as, as taking my eye off the ball, as though I think that that was the biggest threat. I've never called it the biggest threat, but it was the fastest growing. You know, and my wonderful friend and counterpart at MI5 will tell you exactly the same thing, that when I started in CT in 2015... Counterterrorism. Counterterrorism. It was about 6% of our total workload. Certainly when I left 15, 16 months ago, it was over 20% of our workload. But there were many serious, credible threats against Meghan, were there, emanating from the far right Absolutely. In this country. If you'd seen the stuff that was written and you were receiving it, the kind of rhetoric that's online, if you don't know what I know, you would feel under threat all of the time. So you were convinced that there was a genuine threat to Meghan's life on a, you know, on more than one occasion, on several occasions? We had teams investigating it. People have been prosecuted for those threats. I think Megan felt it was going to be a little bit intense. I think she thought that, but she did not know to the degree it was going to be. To the point that she was suicidal. To the point that there were serious allegations. The MI6 knew threats to her life. You keep on saying, Oh, the left. It's unfortunate. And I feel that being born into a royal family is one of the hardest things ever. I think it was hard for Harry as well as it was hard for William. We will never know whether William felt that, okay, yes, I can be king. I want to be king. Maybe he did not. But it's very much about Harry and Meghan. And it was a situation where Megan was suicidal and Harry, he had seen this with his mother. And when the press began to hound Megan, there was a rage inside of him that erupted, that had laid low for a long time, for many years. And the second they did it with Megan, all the therapy went out the window and he said, I gotta go. In the eulogy that Diana's brother spoke on her behalf, he said, it is a point to remember that of all the ironies about Diana, perhaps the greatest was this, a girl given the name of the ancient goddess of hunting was in the end the most haunted person of the modern age and Harry could see the repetition. And he didn't hesitate. He was prepared to leave. He was prepared to leave a country that he felt that he did not necessarily belong. Where now we have learned that his father even reminded him of James Hewitt and how perhaps Harry was not his son. He didn't belong. He hadn't belonged in that family for years. What was he staying for? What was he staying for? He wanted to go. He wasn't going to see his wife diminish before his eyes. There was leaking from the palace, so he said. And so where people feel that he's throwing his family under the bus, they were thrown under the bus first. Now, after months of anticipation and promotional TV interviews, today the world can finally get their hands on Prince Harry's new memoir, Spare. 
Many have criticised Prince Harry for uh, lambasting his loved ones and causing potential damage to the future of the monarchy, but our next guest has always been supportive of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Owen Scobie, who wrote about the couple stepping down as senior royals in the book Finding Freedom, is one of the few people in the world who's already read Prince Harry's memoir, Cover to Cover, and he joins us now to share his thoughts. Welcome. It's good to Morning. have you here today. So you have read it Cover to Cover, a sort of overview feeling of what you saw. Was it what you were expecting? Yes and no. I remember when this book was first announced, they put an emphasis on, on it being a memoir, that it yeah. would be sort of the sophisticated, sort of elevated read that I thought may be sort of maybe full of PR spin. If anything, I was surprised at just how candid Harry is, mm -hmm. not just on the sort of realities of his existence as a member of the royal family, but also through his own personal struggles, talking about how he dealt with drugs, how he coped with things before discovering therapy. I think it's a really sort of deep look at someone that has been so misunderstood and sort of caricatured in the British tabloids. And we actually get to hear it in his own words yeah. for once. So you got an advanced copy. So um, we know everybody knows that you're sort of close to them. You say you haven't met them. Uh, or have you met them? I've met them through my job as a royal correspondent, right. but I haven't spent sort of personal time with them. I'm not their friend. I know the tabloids like to sort of focus on that side of it. But listen, the reality is, as covering the royals, you have certain teams that you build closer relationships mm -hmm. to. And myself, when Meghan came on the scene, felt sort of more drawn to their story. And but so do you, just the, the question is, it, it, with, with having that uh, knowledge, there was a rumour that he wanted to pull the book uh, and, uh, and that went around and, and listen, you know, we've, we've all been hearing so much about sources yeah. and rumours and things that are planted and lies and goodness knows what. Do you know anything about that? I remember at, at the time that this sort of rumour of the book being sort of it sort of it called into question. There were talks about the release date of the book. There were certainly sort of back and forth between Harry and the publisher. Obviously, the publisher picks, wants to pick at a time where it's sort of the opportune moment to sell the most copies of the book. Mm. Harry's thinking of sort of moments that are happening in his family's life and how he can try and avoid them. So I know of those conversations that took place, but from what I've been told, there was never a moment in which Harry wanted to sort of pull back on doing this book. He was always confident that he wanted to be able to tell his story and I think with or without a book deal we would have been hearing from him at some point mm. in time just to want to put his voice on the sort of historical record of his life. There's been a, a you know a lot of criticism saying that this is an attack on the royal family and um, that's something you disagree with you say there's a whole lot more to this book and actually you go further and you say that there are similarities between this book and a book that King Charles himself Penned. I mean, maybe not directly, Jonathan yeah. Dimbleby directed, but he, he signed it off himself. What makes you say that? Well, of course, look, we all know Diana's involvement with Andrew Morton in 92. Of course, at the time, they didn't admit it to the world, mm. but she was heavily involved in that. It was all based on her tapes. Mm -hmm. But of course, in 1994, Charles did exactly the same thing with BBC journalist Jonathan Dimbleby. He sat down for countless hours to talk about his life at length, candidly, but also gave access to 10,000 private letters, his journals, his diaries. This is all being confirmed on the record, and the book was based on all of that. He also opened up his contacts book to allow any of his friends or aides to speak to the author as well. And the reason for wanting to do that is Charles felt very misunderstood by the public. He felt that the sort of lens that his life had been seen through was mostly through the tabloids, and he wanted to be able to show the world who he was. Mm -hmm. And I understand that even now, looking back, there are no regrets about doing that, despite the fact this was a book that spoke about how cold that relationship was that he had with his mother, how Prince Philip was almost a sort of bullyish character in mm. his life that wanted to, him to grow up to be an aggressive leader and far from the man that he actually was. So I think it's a sort of reoccurring theme that members of the royal family feel misunderstood, that their lives are seen in a different way through the tabloids, and ultimately they want to put their voice back onto their story. Do you yeah. think the reaction would have been different if at that point, when that book came out, there had been social media and there had been online papers? Well, listen, The Sun ran a poll at the time after this book had come out and after a documentary with the same journalist came out. And I think two thirds of its readers called for Charles to not become king. They felt that he wasn't suitable for the role because he had attacked his family. There were columnists that said he should be stripped 
of his titles. I mean, this all sounds really familiar, right? But of course, we forget time moves on. And I think Harry, of course, is in a less important position than his father, but we still feel as passionately about the fact that he has lifted the lid on the private world of a very sort of mysterious family that like to keep their privacy. And in many ways, we feel defensive of the royal family. We know they can't answer back to the things that he's brought up in the book. So for many, it feels as if he's sort of put them in an unfair position. Do you think one, he has? I think that he himself is, an unfair, is, is in an unfair position mm-hmm. where his life has been told by countless journalists over and over again with sort of true and untrue versions of stories, yeah. myself included. I'm one of those journalists that's written endlessly about his life and often had to rely on sources, secondhand information, friends of, ex-friends of. But you're never going to get the gospel sort of like truth from the horse's And Sorry, can mouth. I just ask you, when you say sources, and I know yeah. obviously I'm not going to ask you to reveal sources, I never would, I know you wouldn't anyway. Um, but is that a world that you recognise this? Because it, there's plenty in the book about these family members leaking or briefing or brief and most importantly briefing against each other sort of throwing dirt about one to sort of promote the other is that a world you recognize as as a journalist it's a part of a world i recognize i think harry's view of it is perhaps slightly more i guess basic than what it actually is behind the scenes obviously it's far more nuanced but yes of course there is a world in which palace aides brief about other members of the family to journalists. Now, listen. In a negative way. Sometimes in a negative way, sometimes in a deflective way. Sometimes it's just idle gossip. Have you been on the receiving end of those briefings? I've been on the receiving end of briefings about other members of the royal family from aides that don't work for those members of the royal family. Now, now it's not necessarily negative information, but gossip goes around the, the palace. We, they we share hear, things we that hear they shouldn't constantly share. on a tiny scale, yeah. a very unimportant scale for, for us. You know, there'll be a story and you'll know it's not true and it'll be printed and then it'll say sources have been contacted and you know they haven't. Yeah. Um, or a source says and you think, well, that's not anyone I know and that's certainly not come from us. So, you know, we, we, uh, you get to learn to treat those things with an element of caution. Yeah. Uh, What Harry seems to have done is to confirm that certainly in the royal circles, that those are true, Mm. that there are people briefing against him, that there are offices working against each other, constantly trying to shuffle who is more important in the pack. It's a popularity contest, there's no doubt about that. But I think sometimes it's all also things that aren't as personal as he thinks it is. I remember one story about Harry and Meghan not getting planning permission for something in their garden, and it was a, splashed all over the Daily Mail at the time, and it made them look like they had done something that they shouldn't have done. There were questions over why it was a security matter, which it said in the council paperwork. I remember speaking to a palisade at the time that said this whole thing had come from the fact that Charles had gifted them a gazebo for their garden and hadn't done the appropriate checks or whoever was working on the project hadn't done the appropriate checks. This was a gift that Harry and Meghan had received. But when Harry and Meghan wanted to put that side of the story out there, Palisades intervened because they felt that it would have made Charles look bad. So they had to stand back and take the hit for that story. As innocuous as it sounds, but as you know, all of these things get spun into sort of something far more negative. Mm. And I think it's those experiences and the repeatedness of it that they got really fed up of. So I don't think it's always an agenda to make them look bad, but it's often a way of sort of protecting others when, of course, them in the process are the collateral damage. I felt that it was such a missed opportunity because... Megan would have been fabulous and a fabulous ambassador for the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth that 70% of the, the countries are black. It's a shame and it's unfortunate that she has a sister, stepsister, who is responsible for negative tweets about her. We've never seen anything quite like this. What was interesting to me about that report is that it showed that there were a handful of accounts that weren't just bots, but they were people who were highly coordinated and deeply networked 
I'm responsible for the vast majority of hate propaganda against the couple. We looked at 114,000 tweets, and we were able to then determine that 70% of the hateful content came from just 83 accounts, and they had a reach of 17 million people. So this is not your everyday trolling. They were coordinating and talking about what they would discuss for that particular day or week, what pictures they should disseminate. They were actively recruiting people, telling people how to create multiple accounts, how to use VPNs, you know, virtual private networks to hide the IP so they don't get suspended. It's insane. What is it about Meghan Markle that has driven Prince Harry to not own every scenario? Who is the victim? Is because she separated him from him. And it was done by people who were just not the typical quote unquote trolls. These are housewives, these are middle aged Caucasian women creating just constant attacks from go back to America to basically, you know, why don't you die? Samantha Markle was part of the group that was putting out a lot of this disinformation. Samantha had her account suspended, and then we actually sent Twitter a list because she had like 11 additional accounts. And you know, we were baffled by this. You know, how can the half sister of, of Megan be part of a hate group? They did the investigation. It all came from the sister. I feel that there's an anger, and I feel that Megan is giving, actually, you hold her in very high standard because you really think that she is responsible for Harry leaving. You think that she is responsible for all of Harry's issues. She is the one that is in the driving seat saying, Harry, do this. Harry, don't do that. Harry is his own man. And as you very well know, Harry had his own issues before Megan came. Megan came into his life and saved him. She didn't destroy him. She wouldn't have wanted this. What would have been her motive? I kept on asking myself, you give up everything for this life, what would have been your motive? You absolutely take on everything and your new life and you adopt it but not when it is now a detriment to your own life, no, and then to your own mental health. It's not worth it. Nothing is worth it. And I think that they thought, we can push Megan out. We can drive her out. And they did. And they would have eventually. I think that they did not know that Harry would leave. But I saw it right away because you've given nothing to Harry. And to add to that, you took from him what he held most dear. And then this question about who his father is. Why would anybody stay? And you know the beautiful thing about God? He tells you, have blind faith. Believe in me and I will show you. I don't think Harry knew what to do. I think he just left. But you see God, the God that we pray to, the architect of us all, he put angels in their path. So when they were told, no money for you, you're not going to get this, you're not going to get that, a certain individual known as Tyler Perry he said, come on through. Those are the angels. When you think that you are alone, he will put angels in your path. Because I believe that they wanted to squeeze Harry and threaten him to the point that he will come back with his tail between his legs, thinking that he's not equipped for the life outside of the royal family to come back into the fold, and there he must stay. What people don't understand, and it's in the Bible, you grew up in a family, you have your own family, and you go. 
most especially when you have a child. Because once the child is born, you are reborn. And that really becomes your family. And I know in my soul, somewhere in those palace walls, there were a couple of royal family members who sat back and really looked at Harry with admiration. He had done what they could only dream of doing. He had done and gone the distance and they did not think he would make it. The docu-series was good, you know. It talked about, you know, Harry's childhood, Megan's childhood, and how she was raised by a single mother. And, you know, it talked about her schooling. It talked about her acting, about her friends. It talked about, you know, their wedding. And Megan should have had the support because where Kate had 10 years before she married William, Megan only had two, perhaps even 18 months before she had to prepare. The royal aides, they should have stepped back and said, let us help her to help us. Let's help Megan to help us. They should have turned around and said, Harry, thank you for bringing Megan in because she's a representative and she's a demographic that we have not really been able to reach. Now we can do that because Megan will do it. We'll get the embrace. That was the missed opportunity. I think Megan is very strong. I think that she held out for as long as she could. But I also know for a fact that they did the right thing. She would not have made it here. She would not have had any quality of life here. She would never have had it. She had to leave. And Harry left with her. To the surprise, to the disappointment, to the anger, and to the admiration of some. Harry left too. I wish them well. I wish their children well. And time will heal. And time will move on like it always does. And I hope that the two families can come together. And if it doesn't happen that way, at least they have each other. All of my love, darlings, don't forget to like, to subscribe, Hit the notification button and I will see you all sooner than later. Diana, Princess of Wales, younger brother. The ninth, Earl Spencer. I stand before you today, the representative of a family in grief, in a country in mourning, before a world in shock. We are all united not only in our desire to pay our respects to Diana, but rather in our need to do so. For such was her extraordinary appeal that the tens of millions of people taking part in this service all over the world, via television and radio, who never actually met her, feel that they too lost someone close to them in the early hours of Sunday morning. It is a more remarkable tribute to Diana than I can ever hope to offer her today. Diana was the very essence of compassion, of duty, of style, of beauty. All over the world, she was a symbol of selfless humanity, a standard bearer for the rights of the truly downtrodden, a very British girl who's who transcended nationality, someone with a natural nobility who was classless and who proved in the last year that she needed no royal title to continue to generate her particular brand of magic. Today is our chance to say thank you for the way you brightened our lives, even though God granted you but half a life. We will all feel cheated always that you were taken from us so young, and yet we must learn to be grateful that you came along at all. Only now you are gone do we truly appreciate what we are now without and we want you to know that life without you is very, very difficult. We have all despaired at our loss over the past week and only the strength of the message you gave us through your years of giving has afforded us the strength to move forward. 
There is a temptation to rush to canonize your memory. There is no need to do so. You stand tall enough as a human being of unique qualities, not to need to be seen as a saint. Indeed, to sanctify your memory would be to miss out on the very core of your being, your wonderfully mischievous sense of humor with a laugh that bent you double, your joy for life transmitted wherever you took your smile and the sparkle in those unforgettable eyes, your boundless energy which you could barely contain. But your greatest gift was your intuition, and it was a gift you used wisely. This is what underpinned all your other wonderful attributes. And if we look to analyze what it was about you that had such a wide appeal, we find it in your instinctive feel for what was really important in all our lives. Without your God-given sensitivity, we would be immersed in greater ignorance at the anguish of AIDS and HIV sufferers, the plight of the homeless, the isolation of lepers, the random destruction of landmines. Diana explained to me once that it was her innermost feelings of suffering that made it possible for her to connect with her constituency of the rejected. And here we come to another truth about her. For all the status, the glamour, the applause, Diana remained throughout a very insecure person at heart, almost childlike in her desire to do good for others so she could release herself from deep feelings of unworthiness of which her eating disorders were merely a symptom. The world sensed this part of her character and cherished her for her vulnerability whilst admiring her for her honesty. The last time I saw Diana was by the first, her birth in London, when typically she was not taking time to celebrate a special day with friends, but was guest of honour, a fundraising charity evening. She sparked, of course, but I would rather cherish the days I spent with her in March when she came to visit me and my children home in South Africa. I am proud of the fact that, apart from she was on public display meeting President Mandela, we managed to contrive to stop the ever-present paparazzi from getting a single picture of her. That meant a lot to her. These were days I will always treasure. It was as if we had been transported back to our childhood when we spent such an enormous amount of time together, the two youngest in the family. Fundamentally, she hadn't changed at all from the big sister who mothered me as a baby, fought with me at school, and endured those long train journeys between our parents' homes with me at weekends. It is a tribute to her level-headedness and strength that despite the most bizarre life imaginable after her childhood, she remained intact, true to herself. There is no doubt that she was looking for a new direction in her life at this time. She talked endlessly of getting away from England, mainly because of the treatment that she received at the hands of the newspapers. I don't think she ever understood why her genuinely good intentions were sneered at by the media, why there appeared to be a permanent quest on their behalf to bring her down. It is baffling. My own and only explanation is that genuine goodness is threatening to those at the opposite end of the moral spectrum. It is a point to remember that of all the ironies about Diana, perhaps the greatest was this. A girl given the name of the ancient goddess of hunting was, in the end, the most hunted person of the modern age. She would want us today to pledge ourselves to protecting her beloved boys, William and Harry, from a similar fate. And I do this here, Diana, on your behalf. We will not allow them to suffer the anguish that used regularly to drive you to tearful despair. And beyond that, on behalf of your mother and sisters, I pledge that we, your blood family, will do all we can to continue the imaginative and loving way in which you are steering these two exceptional young men so that their souls are not simply immersed by duty and tradition, but can sing openly as you planned. We fully respect the heritage into which they have both been born, and will always respect and encourage them in their royal role. But we, like you, recognize the need for them to experience as many different aspects of life as possible, to arm them spiritually 
and emotionally for the years ahead. I know you would have expected nothing less from us. William and Harry, we all care desperately for you today. We are all chewed up with sadness at the loss of a woman who wasn't even our mother. How great your suffering is, we cannot even imagine. I would like to end by thanking God for the small mercies he's shown us at this dreadful time, for taking Diana at her most beautiful and radiant, and when she had joy in her private life. Above all, we give thanks for the life of a woman I'm so proud to be able to call my sister, the unique, the complex, the extraordinary and irreplaceable Diana, whose beauty, both internal and external, will never be extinguished from our minds. A moving tribute from Charles Earl Spencer. A breaks out in Western Australia. I've never heard that before. But it's a